So chaotropic environments are hypersaline brines with a high concentration of chaotropes. Broadly speaking, chaotropes can be thought of as order breakers, which disrupt H bonding. Um, in bulk solution, these will denature biological macromolecules, uh, leading to cell death in high enough concentration. So uh, a common chaotrope, environmental chaotrope, would be chloride. So in a very high concentration of chloride, this will inhibit cellular function via uh, protein denaturation and enzyme inhibition. And to a certain um, concentration, and for example, in this magnesium chloride brine in Southern California, being largely considered sterile in these upper limits. However, there's some speculative evidence of active life within magnesium chloride saturated DHABs. Uh, DHABs, uh, deep sea hypersaline anoxic basins. These are anoxic brine environments that are found in benthic depressions, generally in closed seas, such as the Eastern Mediterranean and <clears throat> the Red Sea. So there's a few dozen DHABs that have been discovered. Most of them are sodium chloride saturated with um, a swath of evidence showing active microbial communities, while only three have been shown to be magnesium chloride dominated. So within this interface layer, so in, in this figure, this is just showing a basic DHAB, so an ancient evaporite, which then dissolves, forming a brine that collects in a benthic depression. Here we have a two to three meter interface layer where you have an extremely steep chemocline going from about zero millimolar, um, sorry, zero molar all the way upwards of five molar magnesium chloride within the brine end member in that only two to three meter interface zone. So the current magnesium chloride limit of life is around 2.3. Um, some studies going as far to say that it's around three molar in some of these uh, DHABs. Whereas again, as I mentioned, this brine being four to five molar magnesium chloride, and there's some speculative evidence in the cryos brine that shows sulfate reduction. So this was just to really highlight this limit being around 2.3, and then the brine itself being the four to five molar, which is significantly more stressful. The reason why we're interested in DHABs, especially magnesium chloride DHABs, uh, that they share some similarities in the hypothesized uh, brine lenses on Europa, as well as some perchlorate brines on Mars, uh, and then subsurface oceans of Enceladus. So we get this nice window to extraterrestrial brines via the scope of the DHABs. And the motivation of this project that I'll be talking about today is to under, better understand microbial, microbial adaptation to magnesium chloride brines as the genes associated with life in these environments are virtually unknown. There are some strategies that are associated with sodium chloride adaptation, but specific to magnesium chloride, there are some holes. And the limits of life in magnesium chloride brines um, are poorly defined. There's, there's a lot of speculation of whether they're in a higher concentration brine in that four to five molar zone. So the study I'll talk about today is evolution of E. coli to increase its magnesium chloride stress. So the goal of this project was to engineer KO tolerant E. coli strains using adaptive laboratory evolution, hereby known as AL for short, uh, with the purpose to identify genes that confer magnesium chloride tolerance, with the big Y to have this improved molecular understanding of the limits of life in chaotropic brines. So adaptive laboratory evolution, or ALE, again, is based upon principles of Darwinian evolution to develop evolved microbial strains. So you can think of you'd have your original population of cells in your test tube. If you increase a given stressor, in my case, magnesium chloride, you'll have some rare survivors that might have a better adaptation just for, through random mutation to the changing environment. This will then result in a um, population of cells that are slightly more tolerant to the stressor. And as you keep going down the line, you'll have more and more rare survivors until you eventually have a stress resistant lineage that is nearly ident uh, genetically identical to that of the starting strain. So once I completed my um, evolution experiment over a number of months, I could then elucidate these mutations using a bioinformatics pipeline known as BreSeq. So this involves taking the ancestral strain as well as your evolved strain, throwing that through a uh, sequencing company. So I, I went through a Lumina platform and then plugging into BreSeq, which will then output a user summary file that essentially compares the ancestral genome to that of the evolved genome and identifies where mutations have occurred throughout the course of your AL experiment. So the brief method here was to grow E. coli and LB in three lineages shown here. 
incubating them, checking for CFUs as well as phenotype on auger plates, check, tracking their ODs over time and storing some in minus 80. And again, at every single subsequent transfer, I'm increasing the magnesium chloride concentration and repeating the process. So after about 200 generations, I saw nearly a um, tolerance growth, sorry, growth tolerance that nearly doubled through the course of ale. From a macro perspective, just looking at the cells phenotypically, the ancestral strain form, you know, just a classic dense, here's a classic dense E. coli culture in LB, whereas the evolved strains were forming this biofilm, this large macro structure that was actually tying itself in knots from this image here. So all the cells really aggregating and clumping up close together. I also noticed a corresponding decrease in cell density and a depressed growth rate. So after the course of ale to confirm that I'm actually getting the phenotype of increased growth magnesium chloride. So on the left here, we have um, growth of E. coli just in zero millimolar magnesium chloride LB. LB is just a rich protein broth that's commonly used for uh, mesophiles such as E. coli. So in red, I have the ancestor. Uh, in green and blue, I have the B and the C lineage. These are the two evolved lineage after the course of ale. I have OD600 um, on the, the y-axis, which is just a measure of optical density. So this is, um, this is used to estimate cell density in a culture with time on the x in hours. And what I found was that uh, the evolved strains had a slightly depressed growth rate compared to that of the ancestor, whereas um, growing them at an elevated magnesium chloride concentration the ancestor never achieved growth, as you can see here by this flat red line, whereas the B and the C lineages are reaching a significant uh, cell density um, with nearly similar growth rates at 375 millimolar magnesium chloride. I was curious to see how the strains would respond to other salts to see if there was a more universal chaotropic, sorry, more universal solute stress tolerance, or if their adaptation was very specific to that of magnesium chloride. I noticed that obviously the evolved strain is more KO tolerant. Um, in sodium chloride, we saw that the greatest tolerance was actually surprisingly with the ancestral strain, which is probably indicating a very specific adaptation. Within magnesium sulfate brines, again, another environmentally um, relevant brine, uh, we're seeing the same trend of just a slightly depressed uh, cell density. So the blues being the evolved lineages whereas the ancestor growing to much higher cell densities of magnesium sulfate. But what was great to see is with um, calcium chloride, um, we saw the same trend with that of magnesium chloride. So we're seeing strong growth in calcium chloride at 350 millimolar with that of the evolved lineage, evolved lineage so the blue, whereas the ancestor never achieving growth. So this told us our, our interpretation was that the cells have a very specific chloride adaptation. Um, upon analysis of the BreSeq data, so again, comparing the two genomes, the ancestral as well as the evolved lineages, the two mutations that were shared amongst uh, the evolved strains B and C were involved in the MEN-C gene, which is involved in the production of menaquinoids. These have a role in electron transport in the cell membrane, uh, and ubiquinone has been previously shown to increase osmotic stress tolerance um, in certain bacteria. So the MEN-C gene, we need to further elucidate this and really um, dive deep into literature to have a better understanding. But just from first glance, there's some previous research that suggests that this MEN-C mutation um, would confer an increased osmotic tolerance. Uh, and the other mutation that was shared was in the RCS system. So the RCS genes regulate colonic acid production, also known as EPS. EPS is this negatively charged polysaccharide that forms a protective sheath around the cell, previously shown to desiccate, uh, sorry, to protect cells from desiccation as well as osmotic stress. So this brief figure um, uh, from this paper indicated here, we have the environmental stimuli. So if this is your cell membrane, this is inside the cell. Uh, this is the, the peptidoglycan layer. Um, we would have an environmental stimuli represented by the black lightning bolts. The RCS system is then activated phosphor uh, this phosphorylation cascade, resulting in the production of EPS, which is this capsule indicated. So then the EPS would then be exuded outside of the cell and then protecting it from the osmotic stress. So we identified 
RCSD and RCSB gene mutations. The hypothesis right now, simply put, is just that the um, evolved strain is probably producing excess EPS. So the magnesium chloride is perturbing the cell membrane, activating the RCS fossil relay. So the mutated RCS genes might be upregulating EPS production. And there's previous evidence showing the properties of EPS binding heavy metals, such as calcium or, uh, sorry, not calcium, zinc or arsenic. So it's possible that this EPS also has a magnesium binding effect. And again, this being consistent with that snotty phenotype of just this really large molecular, uh, sorry, macro structure in the, the test tubes. So now that we've seen the in silico data, so the BRISIC data, how do we find that smoking gun? How do we determine if these genes actually confer magnesium chloride tolerance? And this is now being done via genetics. Uh, I'm using the Lambda Red system, so I've successfully knocked out the genes of interest. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I'll just talk about the RCSD gene. Um, and the Lambda Red system involves creating PCR products that have an antibiotic resistant cassette that will share homology to a target region. So if the yellow um, indicates the homologous region of the target cell, so like this would be the whole genome of the target cell, for example, I'm creating this linear, this double-stranded PCR product. So I have my antibiotic resistant cassette here with the region of homology through recombination. Uh, the antibiotic resistant cassette will replace itself with that of the, the gene of interest. So you'll excise the RCSD gene and these knockouts that then appear as drug resistant colonies. I then verified through PCR um, that I'm amplifying the RCSD gene product with my starting strain, and I'm not amplifying the RCSD gene product with my knockouts. So indicated here with the no amplification. Furthermore, I just want to double check that I'm actually in the right spot. So I designed primers that would uh, design primers that would um, show this final construct to uh, indicate that the antibiotic resistant cassette has been inserted in the correct spot. In the starting strain, not seeing that amplification, whereas in the knockout, and also through sequencing, showing that we actually have this correct final construct. So the future work is to create this library, as I've um, almost completed, of all the mutations that I've identified via Brisi, to create double knockouts. So to um, remove maybe the MenC gene, the RCSB gene, men, uh, RCSD gene, removing those in tandem to identify the changes, magnesium chloride tolerance. And lastly, what would be the, the best scenario would be to recreate the exact mutations that were identified via BRISIC. And from there, once I have this library constructed, I can determine the KO tolerance of my mutants, um, which would then tell me exactly what the story is of how these genes are affecting the magnesium chloride tolerance of this E. coli. And for the purpose of this talk, um, obviously, we're all interested in the halophiles, are really interested in these. Uh, these critters that have much more significance to an astrobiological, astrobiological context. And I want to mention that I'm continuing these same ale experiments with that of Halobacterium salinarum, a model halophile, as well as Methanohalophilus porticolensis. So the same workflow um, of ale to increasing magnesium chloride tolerance with those model halophiles that I'm um, very much looking forward to um, sharing the results with soon. And lastly, I just want to make some acknowledgments to the Bartlett Lab. Um, this is my lab at uh, UC San Diego at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Here's the Bartlett Lab pictured here, um, as well as Oceans Across Space and Time. This is a recently awarded NASA project that I'm funded under. Um, Eric Allen, one of my committee members, who's been extremely helpful in developing uh, the, the knockout procedure. Uh, a big shout out to Marco Alleman for sharing his relevant strains with me. And then Benjamin Colempe, um, great friend and um, graduate student that we've been, I've been working very closely with. And lastly, Jeff Bowman, um, another one of my committee members. Uh, thank you very much.